Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Eikhoff, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Associate Director of Alumni Relations at John Carroll University. Thank you for joining us this evening for our next installment of the John Carroll University Alumni Author Series. Tonight's feature author is Craig R. Roach, PhD, a member of the John Carroll University class of 1972, and a nationally recognized expert on the electricity business. Over the course of his 40-year career, Dr. Roach has been vetted and accepted officially as an expert in regulatory courts and courts of law across North America. He has served in cases involving one of the biggest bankruptcies ever, a first of its kind clean coal investment, a federal preemption case ultimately resolved by the Supreme Court, and the design and implementation of electricity auctions worth billions of dollars. What, set doc, what sets Dr. Roach apart is that he brings both top academic credentials and hard-won hands-on practical knowledge to the electricity business to simply electrifying. He earned his PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin, consistently ranked among the top 10 research institutions in economics in America. He is the founder and president of Boston Pacific Company, Inc., a consultancy specializing in the electricity, in electricity business. He and his firm have become trusted advisors to regulators as well as electric utilities and investors. Dr. Roach brings uh, to Simply Electrifying a reputation for an objective and unbiased eye for the evidence and a commitment to honestly balance the evidence from all sides. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Craig Roach. Dr. Roach, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric. Let me uh, put up a few slides if we can. Again, thank you, Eric, for the kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for zooming in as it, it were. And if I could, I'd like to start on a personal note. It'll soon be 50 years since I graduated from John Carroll. But I'm really happy to say that my John Carroll friends are still among my best friends. They reach out constantly for class reunions, fraternity reunions, and more in these days, Zoom meetings every week. And uh, those, those folks have really shaped what I have done and how I do it in a good way. And this book is, is no exception. Coming to this book, I set up three guidelines for myself. Uh, the first is that I should know what I'm writing about. Uh, and as, as Eric's introduction explained, I've been working on policies for and investments in the electricity business and other energy businesses for almost 40 years. Uh, even though I must say that as I wrote this book, I learned a lot. Um, the second guideline uh, that I said is that I, I wanna write a book that I would love to read. Uh, and I really enjoy narrative nonfiction, which to me means the author has to tell a full story about events and people. Um, we, we have to take a, a wide angled lens on events. It's never just politics, just science. It's the whole range of science and technology, law and politics, economics and business strategy. And then this catch all term called culture, which is shorthand for what society will let us do. That is the way that we can understand the past and, and thereby change the future. The third guideline was that biography has to be at the core of the book. Uh, I, don't, I believe that history is not about what happens to us, History is us doing things. It's what we do. Uh, men and women step up to make history. Nothing is inevitable. So biography is a, a major narrative thread through the book and through, through my writings prior to that book. So with that guideline on biography has to be the heart of the, of the matter, the core of the discussion, you can understand how, why I'm so excited about the first chapter, which is all about Benjamin Franklin. He is one of America's favorite founding fathers. Um, and he did a lot for the country, a lot for, for the world. Uh, one of the most important things he did, as, as everyone knows, is he made a dangerous trip to France and negotiated an alliance with the French that brought the ships and the troops and the supplies that were needed for uh, the American, Americans to win at Yorktown and eventually to win the Revolutionary War. What was intriguing to me was how did the French know Benjamin Franklin? Why did they trust him? And the answer is that by then he was an internationally famous 
scientist and, and his primary field of study was electricity. Uh, he, uh, around 1747, he left his lucrative printing business and decided to help the world and help, help uh, America in particular. And one of the things he did was he said, I, you know, I'm into electricity. I want to be what you and I would call a public intellectual. So he began to send letters to Peter Collinson in London and Collinson would actually read these letters uh, out to the public and they concerned Franklin's uh, experiments. They, they concerned his views on, on electricity. If you and I had one thought uh, before this book about linking Franklin to science, we would think about his kite experiment and that's legitimate because the kite experiment was intended to uh, show that show the world that this fearsome thing called electricity was best understood as an electrical phenomenon. Um, the, the first experiment, the first kite experiment that was done was actually done in France outside of Paris. And again, that reflects the fact that, that uh, Franklin's writings were, were, were sent to Europe, uh, translated into several languages. But that's the first successful uh, application. There's now there's uh, Franklin uh, claims that he did a similar experiment that he did the kite experiment, but there's been some controversy over the years because uh, there's a courier in Ives in, in Ives engraving that shows uh, Franklin out in the midst of a storm with a kite uh, trying to bring lightning down to test that it was electricity. Uh, that's certainly one of the things I should say. Don't try this at home. Uh, it was a very dangerous experiment. There are reason to believe that he never did it in those circumstances, but there's no reason to believe that he didn't try it uh, under other circumstances, milder weather, um, less, less threatening weather. Uh, I've told the story about Fran Franklin's kite and where it leaves us is where the, the epigram leaves us here is that he's famous for two reasons. He snatched the lightning from the sky and the scepter from the tyrants. Um, and, and for that reason, we, can, we know that electricity brought light to people around the world eventually, but for Americans, electricity also helped bring freedom. Franklin is the kind of scientist we need today. He has great intellect, he shows integrity, he shows imagination, and he's a celebrity of sorts. He literally sparked interest in uh, electricity as a scientific topic around the world. And he really launched that, that part of the scientific world. Um, most people, including not myself in this book, uh, call this, this particular time the, the age of Franklin. Whoops. I wanna stick with this emphasis on science now and talk about two more scientists in, in the age of Franklin. It's um, Michael Faraday, and James Clerk Maxwell. Faraday uh, was an English scientist who in 1821 developed the first rudimentary electric motor. And then 10 years later, he developed the first rudimentary electric generator. And that's why in the quote on the epigram in this slide, we say that from this simple laboratory toy was to come the whole of the electric power industry. In other words, with a basic electric generator and a basic electric motor, you, you had the start of the electricity business. What's interesting is what the core idea behind both the motor and the generator were. The core idea was that Faraday linked electricity and magnetism. Even to this day, most electricity around the world is generated in a simple way. We take a magnet, spin it around inside a coil of wire that, that releases electrons in a flow of electrons quote unquote, is what we consider to be electricity. Again, the intriguing question to me is of all the areas that Faraday could research, why did he pick this link between electricity and magnetism? The reason he tells us is that he was a deeply religious person. And he believed that if there is one God, there should be one force. That is all the major forces of the day should be transformable from one, uh, one stage to another. And, and the, the major uh, forces of the day were, were electricity, magnetism, light, 
and gravity. And he, of course, focused on the first two. Faraday, in terms of his biography, he, he grew up very poor. Uh, he was largely self-taught, although some kind people where he lived in London uh, got him um, hot tickets to uh, scientific lectures. He learned a lot from those lectures, but he also had no mathematics. There is another scientist, however, that was a great admirer of Faraday's, and that's James Clerk Maxwell. He could not have been more different from Faraday. He was a prodigy, he was well-educated, and he was fluent in math. Uh, the famous output of that of James Clerk Maxwell or Maxwell's equations, and it, uh, again, focuses in on this relationship among forces. Uh, he, is a, he discovered the uh, electromagnetic field and the way he depicts it, it begins with an electric field that, that, that then creates a magnetic field and then that creates an electric field and then we go on in this game of leapfrog out into the future. It's a major contribution to science even today and it's also a major uh, support for our technologies. It's the, it's the way that our smartphones work. This brings me back to a broader look at science once again in, in, in the age of, of, of Franklin. Um, in, in the 1930s, Einstein would write a book about the evolution of physics, the, the path to mod, modern physics. And he would say that electricity was not just a stop along that path to modern physics, it was the path itself, meaning that the study of electricity was the way we got to many of the major breakthroughs uh, in, in physics. Um, that's important for today. Uh, you'll hear me make this point a couple of times today. Uh, we in the electricity business don't have the technologies we really need to confront our new situation. We need technologies that are still reliable around the clock, but we need them to have zero carbon emissions and we need them to cost about the same as fossil fuels today. We don't have that. And the way we're going to get to it, I think, is to come back to the major scientific breakthroughs that we need. Even if we look at Nobel Prizes, we see hints at this. In 2010, the Nobel Prize in Physics went for the development of a material called graphene, and the, the authors of, of that work uh, spoke in terms of, of uh, getting power from, from the atmosphere. There was another in 2016, a Nobel Prize in Chemistry, Again, they spoke about uh, molecular motors making reference back to Faraday. I really believe that to put America, put the world back on the right course, we need to return to these scientific roots. We're gonna go to the next phase now in the electricity business and the evolution of that business. It's, it's going to be called the age of Edison. It's all about uh, taking this science of electricity and using it to develop a commercial electricity business that would assure that, that electricity is available and affordable to all. The most famous event in this, in this time frame in the electricity business is the uh, battle of the currents. And it's truly a battle between two titans of, of the business. In one corner was Thomas Edison, um, who still holds amazing records for the number of patents secured. He was a major and amazing inventor. Uh, he had a proposal for how we should set up the electricity business, but he had one uh, hang up about electricity. He was very concerned about the dangers of high voltage electricity. Um, and so he proposed what is termed a direct current system. The consequence of that is that he would have, uh, since it was, very expensive to uh, transport um, uh, direct current power. Uh, he would have a system for the electricity delivery that would have a power plant about every mile. And because those power plants would be so small, the cost of power uh, would be very high. Uh, and so his system was an expensive system and didn't really get us to the available and affordable to all. But the, in the other corner of this battle of the currents was George Westinghouse uh, with his quirky sidekick, Nikola Tesla, Tesla the person. And Westinghouse and Tesla had no fear of high voltage power. 
They knew how to control it. They knew how to keep it away from people so that there was no physical harm. And with high voltage electricity, you could transport power for miles and miles. You could reach out to large power plants, no matter where they were, and bring their power back to serve customers, no matter how widely dispersed they were. Um, the, the, the result of this was that power did become cheap and did become available to all. In, in the, in the uh, early part of 1900s, what happened uh, for residential delivery of electricity, for example, is that while in 1907, only 8% of households had electric service, by 1920, 35% had electric service, and by 1948, 90% of American homes had access to electricity. What was going on to drive that was a dramatic drop in price. Over that same time period, the price of electricity to homes dropped 81%. This is what I call the first democratization of electricity. Uh, it was all about electric power that was available and affordable by a vast majority of Americans. I'm gonna turn now, I'm gonna go away a little bit from the bi uh, biography uh, and talk about another thing that I had mentioned earlier. I'd spoken about um, using a wide angled lens on history so that we would know uh, what really caused change and how we could cause change in the future. Um, the wide angled lens when we put it on nuclear power really reveals how important it is to look at all the factors. If you just looked at science for, for nuclear power, first of all, I'll, let me say that nuclear power is still the source of about 20% of all the power in, in the United States. If we try to explain how it got to that substantial share and we look just at science, we would say, well, this, this, uh, this type of power plant, nuclear power, has an impeccable scientific pedigree. It is based on one of the most famous equations anywhere, it's E equals MC squared. It is one uh, of five famous papers that Einstein wrote in the miracle year of 1905. Uh, and again, it's just an, it gives a, an impeccable uh, scientific basis. But that's not what drove the, the, the growth of nuclear power in America. We know that we first used this equation to develop weapons to uh, end the Second World War. Um, but um, a few years after, in 1953, President Eisenhower uh, went to the UN to give a speech. And he spoke in terms of using this great science not to harm man, but to help man. And he spoke very clearly about wanting uh, nuclear power as a new technology. The problem is that while he wanted that, the circumstances were that we were still very much uh, in a cold war with the Russians and we had to keep our attention on weapons. So the next application of this famous equation, the next application of nuclear power was for submarines, a very small scale application. And there are famous experiments by a, a person who eventually was Admiral Rickover and how we pushed this technology uh, but again, at a, at a very small scale. The Cold War then pushed us to think about making commercial scale power uh, so that we could show the world that American capitalism was, was quite good at this sort of technological development. The problem is that we had to go with Rickover's very small nuclear power plant and scale it up to a commercial level. And those of you in business know just how difficult it is to scale up any technology from, from a beginning uh, level to, to a commercial scale. The federal government was deeply involved. It heavily subsidized nuclear power plants. Uh, and then it, it uh, allowed the subsidies to be uh, added by companies like uh, General Electric and Westinghouse. There was a surge in orders for nuclear power plants, but in the end, after all was said and done, almost half of those power plant orders were, uh, were canceled. What happened, well, some people point to the uh, accidents in, with nuclear power. You'll recall in 1979, the, in the Three Mile Island accident in Pennsylvania, uh, in Chernobyl, Ukraine, and, 
1986, another accident, and then more recently in 2011, the Fukushima power plant in Japan. Nuclear power accidents certainly put uh, a color on the, the uh, use of, of um, nuclear power, but I don't think that's what really led to all the cancellations and which has led to nuclear power being a stalled effort in America. I think it was more about cost. These power plants were meant to be too cheap to meter, but they're actually quite expensive. And I think they were made expensive by the fact that the federal government declared nuclear power to be what I term an official technology. They didn't give nuclear power a chance to develop at its own pace, to develop at its own way. Uh, sometimes we can help a technology too much. Um, and today I would bring that up today. I think I have some of these same concerns about technologies that I think have made good progress, uh, but wind and solar and electric vehicles, uh, maybe we have not allowed them to move so quick at their own pace and their own way. Yeah, nuclear accidents definitely started or contributed to another phase of the electricity business, and that is the age of harm. It got us worrying more about the harm that could be done by power than the great uh, good that is done by electric power. And when we think in terms of the age of power, we have to think about the uh, environmental movement. And if we think about the environmental movement, we, we have to speak about Rachel Carson and her famous book, uh, Silent Spring. Rachel Carson is the mother of the modern environmental movement. Uh, I would say that she is one of the people that has had the biggest effect on the electricity business. And yet she never spoke about the electricity business. She never wrote about the electricity business. Her area of concern was uh, synthetic pesticides. And that's what her 1962 book, Silent Spring is all about. What she gave the environmental movement was a powerful template for environmental activism. Um, she always in her writing had compelling anecdotes. A, a small child would be unexpectedly found dead because of these pesticides. A worker would be found dead because of working with these pesticides. She would link those outcomes, those, those uh, anecdotes to actual science. She spent a lot of time explaining how they might be explained by scientific theory. Uh, and her writing was amazing. Uh, she, could, she had learned how to write and write in compelling terms. If you look at the epigram on this slide, it, it is a haunting uh, excerpt from the very beginning of Silent Spring. It reads that there was once a town in the heart of America where all life seemed to live in harmony with its surroundings. Then a blight crept over the area. No witchcraft, no enemy action had silenced the rebirth of new life in this stricken world. The people had done it themselves. I find that to be a haunting uh, kind of uh, lesson by her, but it illustrates the beautiful writing too. In terms of her biography, she did not have an easy um, childhood. At one point she had to uh, work to raise enough money for her family to, uh, to, to make ends meet. She took a job in what sounds like a, a, a natural and common place for her to go but it was the Fish and Wildlife Department in the federal government. Uh, she again wrote, she was an editor for them, she wrote beautifully. And during that time on her own time, she wrote three best-selling books. Uh, they are together called The, the Biography of the Sea. Uh, but the, fil the, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Department was also one of the few agencies in Washington that had a real concern about pesticides. And so she picked up the idea and when she finally left them, that's where she got the idea of writing uh, Silent Spring. It was a very high profile book. Uh, she was attacked by the industry that made the pesticides. She was attacked by the governments that bought the pesticides and by the scientists who defended them. She had uh, some very high profile encounters uh, the first was President Kennedy at the time took an interest in her book and asked his scientific uh, advisor to look into the issue and to see what should, should be done. Uh, she was in a major 
CBS interview with Eric Severide. Those of you who remember Eric Severide as being one of the top um, reporters in, in the United States. Um, and she was she testified before the Senate in 1964. Very high profile, very high risk. Um, but but along with the template that she gave the environmental movement, I think she gave all of us something else. She gave us all her personal courage because while she was doing these things, while she was at the Senate testifying, uh, while she was doing the interview with CBS, she was dying of cancer and she was in great pain. And I find that to be a compelling personal story where she just took her mind off her own concerns, off her own death and took action to save us from harm. She died in, in August, 1964. Let me turn to the, the last slide here uh, and, and, and tell you a little bit about the problem for writers who write books like this. Um, we have to acknowledge that the book is going to end, but the story is going to continue. So you have to come up with a device that allows you to tactfully end your book. Um, I knew that I wanted to make the end of the book consistent with this emphasis on biography. And I knew exactly who that person would be. Uh, that person is Elon Musk. Um, he is a headliner, was when I was writing the book. He is still a headliner today. We hear a lot today about his SpaceX, his space exploration company uh, that has reusable space capsules. Uh, it's a remarkable technological achievement. Uh, but he has two other businesses that are important to, the, to him. One is Tesla, the electric vehicle which can have a big effect on the demand for electricity. And then the other is solar rooftop and storage devices that can be a big device uh, for increasing supply. The, the, the way I went about closing uh, on Elon Musk, closing on the book was to ask, is Elon Musk listening to, has he uh, listened to, learned from all these lessons of history that, that I've tried to point out in the, in the uh, previous chapters of the book. Um, we've had a lot of people tell us about the lessons of history. Here on this screen is from Huxley um, and tells us that men don't really learn a lot from the lessons of history, but there are many others too. There are quotes from Santayana who said that um, if we fail to study history, we're doomed to repeat it. But my actual favorite one is supposedly by Mark Twain. He said that history does not repeat, but it does rhyme. And the rhyme I would like to see uh, come up in the electricity business today is a second battle of the currents. I would like to see us have a serious competition like the competition between Edison and Westinghouse 100 years ago uh, between the, the established grid that we use, the alternating current grid we use to supply electricity to something very different, something on a much smaller scale, perhaps Musk's solar uh, rooftop with storage, or perhaps uh, other devices, personal generators, or, or uh, uh, microgrids, which are uh, smaller grids. Uh, one of the most notable is at, the, at Princeton. Um, I'd like to see if we could, we could turn to those uh, smaller technologies. And the reason is, the reason I'd like to see the second battle of the currents is because I think we have begun to change our goals for electricity. We now want three different goals. We want doorstep reliability. We want the electricity to stay on inside our homes and our businesses and our factories, no matter what is going on outside. Um, no matter if we have bad weather or cyber warfare, we want, we want the power to stay on. Uh, secondly, we want, many of us want superior environmental performance. We want to pick the technologies that have the minimum emissions, whether those are carbon emissions or other air pollution emissions. And finally, we want choice. We want to be able to say on any particular day that the best deals coming from the grid will take that, or on another day, the best grid, the best deal is coming from these smaller technologies. And that's where we want to go. I really can't predict whether we'll get our second battle of the currents. I can't predict where we will go as a nation. 
Uh, but I can predict that whatever happens will be simply electrifying. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Roach, for uh, sharing your thoughts and, and, and your wonderful book with all of us this evening. We, we greatly appreciate you doing so. Um, I know this was really, really interesting, and I learned a lot about um, these, these men and women who have had a significant um, impact on electricity and our energy policy and kind of where we're going into, you know, into the future. I have a couple of questions and then I invite everyone, if you have questions, to use the chat to uh, ask them uh, of Dr. Roche and I will go ahead and um, ask them on your behalf. Um, the first question, uh, you, you know, you, you're talking about kind of where we are in terms of um, these technologies. And obviously, you know, anyone who is paying attention this, you know, March, or maybe March or, eight, uh, or February knows that there are significant vulnerabilities uh, in our power grid, um, especially as, you know, the Texas grid. And I think some people don't even know that they had their own grid. Um, what can we learn from that? And then what should we be looking to do in order to make either Texas a more sustainable in infrastructure or the general United States um, energy infrastructure more secure, you know, for generations? Well, as you say, we do need new technologies, but just to get this in perspective, um, electricity is a unique product. It's one of the few products where the demand for the product has to precisely equal the supply at every minute of time. If that doesn't happen, the entire system can crash. The voltages can get out of whack. Power plants will turn themselves off. So it's this unique need to balance um, momentary supply and demand that creates a lot of, a lot of problems. Um, so every power system, whether it's ERCOT or any other power system in the country has to really pay attention. So you can envision a power uh, system operator saying, look, um, I, I predict tomorrow there'll be 50,000 units of power needed at the peak. I'm gonna make sure that the power plants that I need to meet that 50, uh, thousand megawatts is, are out there. So they do that kind of security constrained economic dispatch uh, every day. Um, and, and it's really important that, that there are 24 seven operating centers that do that. Now what happens uh, these days, we do have power that just from the get go, we know we can't guarantee will be there tomorrow. And wind is one of those categories. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's not to the, this wind but it's just to realize that uh, it can't do that. So when you plan for tomorrow in an electric system, you have to have other power plants that are at the ready to step in if wind goes away as it can in a severe storm. Um, so you need these backup power plants. I think if I was to look into the Texas situation and what I know about Texas, I would make sure that the incentives for that backup power are substantial. That, that would be something we'd really want to do, whether it's a contract, uh, whether it's a, a financial incentive, uh, whatever it should be, we need to do that, that right. Um, I think um, at the same time, I wanna be fair that the weather conditions, this polar vortex is hit before, we've had it in the East too. Uh, it puts strains on the power system that they're not designed to take. So I would say that we would also want to look here at what the icing that happened uh, on all fuels is natural gas, which surprised me, coal, uh, the, the coal piles can freeze up and then even nuclear power. So we need to revisit that. Once again, it's a matter of incentives for them to be guaranteeing that they'll be there at some point and get making sure that they have some place, uh, some place to be paid for that, for that important service. We certainly don't want another outage like this. The human cost is way, way too great. So again, it brings me around, that's what we can do immediately, but we still need to, to create the road to breakthrough technology. Great, thank you. It was, it was really scary. You know, I, I think I heard that the, the grid was, the Texas grid was about five minutes from complete, complete collapse, which would have been absolutely catastrophic, more catastrophic than it actually was. Um, yeah. 
you know, we've heard a lot about um, energy policy and climate change in the news. And that's, you know, that tends to happen when you have, you know, changes in, in political parties and in government and, and whatnot. Um, but what are your thoughts on how we can lower emissions um, and then create a more sustainable uh, energy uh, structure for generations to come? Yeah, so I, I do think that the evidence is there that we need to do something to address global climate change. Uh, it's a matter, of, it's not whether we should do it, it's how we should do it that I think deserves a lot, a lot of attention. Uh, again, I'm driven by the fact that I don't think we have the technologies that give us 24 seven reliability, zero emissions uh, and, and uh, um, at a cost that's not much greater than what we experience today. And because of that, my, what I'd like to see is a carbon tax. It's very controversial. Um, it's easy to get yourself booed out of a room if you, if you say those words. But uh, the reason I want that, the reason I think it's the best, and I think the reason a, a lot of economists would like it, is that we have to enlist everyone in this global climate change battle. We need to tap into everyone's ideas uh, about how to do this. And I think with a carbon tax, we can create an incentive for everyone to give it a go, like on reducing uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, in whatever uh, place they, they find them. So I think it just opens up um, the, uh, the, the, the whole effort to everyone. Now it's very hard to get a tax done. Uh, I would so much prefer that to someone in Washington in particular picking winners saying, this is the technology we want, that is the technology we don't want. I'd rather let anyone uh, make their own choice. It's very hard to get a carbon tax passed. Um, but a couple of years ago, two notable diplomats, Secretary Baker and Secretary Schultz, they both had been secretaries of treasury and state, backed a plan for a carbon tax. And they did something really clever to make it appeal to those who don't really concern themselves all that much with global climate change. What they proposed is to have the carbon tax, um, but to use the, the money to reduce income taxes. So the theme would be basically that you would say, well, look, um, even if you don't concern yourself about global climate change, so even, even if you don't have that worry, wouldn't you rather have your taxes on something we, we probably don't want in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, instead of taxing uh, hard work and risky investment through income taxes? I think if we're going to get any of this done, it's that combination that would get us, get us someplace with a carbon tax. Great. Uh, we've had a couple questions come in from uh, the, the chat so far. Um, one is, uh, how does your faith or worldview factor into the work that you do? Uh, well, it, it, um, to, to borrow from Faraday uh, and to say that I, I, I think the Jesuits taught us this, to me, faith and science are two sides of a coin. Um, I think the, the scientists that I, I know and, and speak to think in terms of science being our humble attempts, man's humble attempts to understand the world that God made. And I think that I'm comfortable with that. Uh, I see no conflict uh, between science uh, and religion, science and faith uh, in that sense. Uh, the next one is, uh, what is your opinion of the current solar panel uh, battery uh, uh, assemble? Many folks in uh, their town are using uh, both to charge their Teslas. Yeah. Well, um, I, I think it, solar is a technology that to me has great potential. Uh, you know, just to go back at history a little bit, um, Einstein's Nobel was for the photoelectric effect, which is essentially what we're talking about with photo, uh, photo cells, photo, photovoltaic cells. So if I'm so into, into science, I have to say something good about solar because I think the potential there is, is so great. Um, I think um, that um, we need some real advances 
to, to make solar rooftop plus storage um, a, a dependable sort of thing. I think it's good that we're out there, but again, uh, I think we need improvements in the solar cells themselves. I think Musk did interesting things with his storage. His new power wall storage a couple of years ago was, was something that could really uh, work. Uh, I think we, but, but understand what we're doing. We're, we're taking, we're trying to achieve that 24 seven reliability with an intermittent power source, solar. And when we don't use the power in the day, we'll store it and use it uh, when in, in the nighttime. So that's what we're trying to achieve. So I think there's potential. There's already people doing this. Um, I think uh, that we still need some advances. So similar to that, it, it kind of um, springboards into a, a little different sec section. Um, knowing that, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about fossil fuels. Uh, where do you predict in like 40 or 50 years, how much of our electrical will come from wind and solar? Will we be primarily on um, renewable energies? It, it, it's, it's hard to predict. Um, uh, I think we can force it. We could force it so that wind and solar are a substantial part, um, you know, far more than it is today. Today, I, I would say, and we've made advances here, about 60% of our electricity is from fossil fuels. About 40 points of that is natural gas, the other 20 is coal. Um, and then another 20% is nuclear and another 20% is renewables, but it's renewables broadly defined to include hydro. So we have a, a long way to go um, to, to, to get uh, renewables of all sorts to be a substantial portion of it. Uh, it certainly, uh, something we want to do, uh, we want to push harder. We want um, we want new technologies in those two, but we want to open up to many more uh, sources of power. We really do want to use that carbon tax and let people do things that other people say are crazy. That's what we want to, frankly, want people to take a chance. Um, and we've had such good effects in my lifetime with price incentives. You know when. When, when I was working on Capitol Hill in the late 1970s, uh, the price of a barrel of oil was going up and up. And after the Iranian revolution, it had reached $40 a barrel. But at that point, a lot of people were just saying by the mid, uh, you know, like 1985, 1986, the price of a barrel of oil uh, will be $100. You know what it actually was? It was $10. And it was because we took controls and we let the price incentives induce new supply, uh, new ways of doing things. So I have real faith in, um, as an economist, I have real faith in price incentives. And I think if we put that in, we'll, we'll keep moving with these renewables, but we may come up, I think, with substantial new technologies too. Um, one other question, uh, someone who came across the idea of a smart grid, and it was new to them. How is a smart grid different? Like what is a smart grid and how does it compare to what would be a, I guess, a regular grid? Yeah, I, I'd say that what, the idea is that it's digital first, you know, so that it can communicate um, that a line is down. You don't, you don't have to wait for one of your customers to call you at a utility and say the line's down. So it's digital. It's smart in the sense that it detects problems. Uh, it's smart in the sense, if you want it, that it reacts to prices. So uh, if somebody wanted power to be uh, you know, only cheap when it was uh, using power, you know, to wash the dishes at night, to wash clothes at night, to do some commercial uh, practice at night, the smart grid would be able to tell when that price in the marketplace got low and therefore you'd turn on these electric uh, uh, devices, these electric appliances. So, so to me, that's what it is. It can do a lot of things, but it's, it's, it's basically helping us uh, use electricity smart, uh, using it efficiently. Okay. Um, I read an article today and it talked about China and how they are going full bore into electric vehicles. Uh, and what it basically what it said that they are matching, they're moving as fast on electric vehicles as the entire rest of the world combined. How important do you think it is for the United States to push 
further into electric vehicles like Tesla, like like um, GM, uh, Ford? Do you think we're doing enough to be in that space? Yeah, well, I, I think the first thing is to try to put yourself in the ch China's place. Why, why are they doing that? Um, China wants to be the number one economy and they've identified areas where they wanna be number one. Uh, and they're all the areas you would think, EVs are one, robotics, uh, AI, that kind of thing. But think about cars. Um, if, if, if I was in China and I wanted a big market share in the auto business, I wouldn't go head to head with the rest of the world on internal combustion engines. I'm way behind, if I'm China, I'm way behind on that technology. America has a, the Japanese technologies are amazing. They have tweaked so much power out of internal combustion engines, it's amazing. So if I was China, what would I do? I would be uh, looking for a fundamental alternative. So China has an interest in electric vehicles beyond its environmental impact. They want to beat uh, the internal combustion engine. So um, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting. They have this completely new incentive to be, uh, to push electric vehicles. Now at the same time, they have some of the worst pollution in the world and getting that pollution out of the cities by having electric vehicles would help too. So they have two big incentives. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that we, we want electric vehicles to be um, an important American product. I think we want to get barriers out of the way. Uh, I'm interested in it because of what it can potentially do for the environment, but I'm also interested in it doing us good in what essentially is Cold War II, which is uh, the United States versus China. And so we want to be able to go head to head. And I think electric vehicles are one of those ways. But again, I'm not looking to declare it to be an official technology. I want the incentives out there to have people like Musk um, push ahead. And he, he certainly uh, has pushed ahead on this. But, but that's the broad context in which I see the battle on, on EVs and other things with, with the Chinese. I think it's one last question. Um, and it goes back to your the book um, and the and the people you highlight in it. If you had the opportunity to talk to Franklin and Tesla and and Westinghouse and Edison, um, what do you think they would say about our current, you know, where we are with you know technology being on our cell phones and the lights we have, you know, cars drive. I mean, they probably wouldn't know what car is, but you know, what what do you think they would say about you know? our world's dependence on electricity. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, Franklin would have been amazed, um, but I would think that he could have imagined it. I think if, if I was to ask Franklin a question, like I would ask him, how did you possibly, from where you were in colonial times when you were awakened not by an alarm clock, but by a rooster someplace. You know, how did, how did you dream up? How did you imagine electricity, something you can't even see? You can't even see. Um, and so I think he would appreciate um, all the scientists who have followed who, who did the same thing. They imagined it uh, first. Uh, I think um, Edison, uh, Faraday in particular, um, would have been impressed with the commercial success. But I think um, Nikolai Tesla in particular would say, where's the science? We need to get back to the science because he was really a scientist. He's the one that envisioned the AC system. Uh, so I think uh, they would be impressed with the commercial success, the, the, the fact that electricity is available and affordable by all, by most at least. But they would say, now's the time to get back uh, to science, uh, let's do this even better. Great. Uh, one last question. I, I apologize for throwing another one. I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask, how can people learn more about Simply Electrifying and where can they purchase your book if they're interested? Uh, uh, it's sold in Amazon, um, in local bookstores, uh, Barnes and Noble. If you go to craigroach.com, uh, that's the author's website. And 
on that site at the bottom of the home page, you can click on anyone to buy it from anyone, that, including the publisher, but also Amazon and, and Barnes and Noble. Uh, the rest of the website will give you uh, the, the, uh, the, the appearances that I've made uh, for the book. Uh, it'll give you the reviews uh, and, and, and who, who gave those reviews. Uh, it'll give you uh, some, uh, some opinion on, on the book uh, from, from people who, who have read it on their own. So craigroach.com is, is where all that is. Well, great. Thank you again, Dr. Roach, for being with us this evening. It's been wonderful to spend uh, an hour with you and, and learn more about electricity and our grid and uh, where you think we're going into the future. So again, thank you so much. And I know I speak for everyone. John Carroll is incredibly fortunate to have you within our, within our alumni community. So thank you again. That's very kind. Thank you very much for the opportunity. You're welcome. Before we conclude this evening, I want to give you an update on a few other opportunities that you can take advantage of this fall or the spring uh, with, through the Office of Alumni Relations and John Carroll. A week, a week from today, on May 12th, we'll focus on one of the landmarks of childhood, youth sports. The Aspen Institute reports that over 70% of children aged 6 to 12 participate in at least one sport. However, this number drops significantly as students progress into middle and high school. Join Brian Garrity, PhD, class of 2000, director and associate professor of the Master of Arts in uh, Sport Coaching Program at the University of Denver, and Brian Biggie, class of 2004, an administrator in John Carroll's Exercise Science and the Mike Cleary Sports Studies Program, as they discuss why youth sports remains vital to the biological, psychological, and sociological development of children. It would also explore the future of youth sports with a focus on participation, privatization, and sport specialization. On May 17th, John McMurray, MSJD, Chair of the Society for American Baseball Research Dead Ball Era Committee and Oral History Committee, and a lecturer in the Tim Russert Department of Communication, will focus on Larry Doby and his baseball legacy. Doby integrated the American League just a few short months after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball. While his story is not as well known as Jackie, uh, Dobby and Dolly faced many of the same hurdles, prejudices, and hardships. It should truly be a fascinating discussion. And on May 19th, join us as we put the spotlight on Chelsea Rubino, class of uh, 2014, and Jerry Rubino, class of 2013, owners of Selva Tea Company, for our next installment of the Alumni Spotlight. It is well known that herbal teas have a number of health benefits, including stimulating the immune system, improving digestion, and lowering cholesterol. Chelsea and Jerry will share the story of Selva Tea, which features herbal teas sourced from jungles and other interesting ecosystems all over the globe. You can find more information about and register for all of our upcoming programs, including our alumni author series, scholarly lunches, our alumni continuing education series, and our alumni spotlight events, at jcu.edu backslash alumni. Additionally, we invite you to uh, view the recordings of all of our previous programs on the JCU Alumni Association YouTube channel. To view our extensive uh, library, search for John Carroll University Alumni on YouTube. Finally, please consider making a charitable donation to John Carroll in support of our students, faculty, and our entire campus community. If you've already made a gift this year, thank you for your generosity. If you have not, Please join me in supporting JCU so that we can continue to deliver an outstanding education to our current and future blue streaks. You can make a donation by visiting jcu.edu backslash give. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Take care, be well, stay safe, and onward on, John Carroll. <laughs>